Amen. Well, let me introduce you to my family. Uh, up here, you can see the family picture. You've got me and my bride, uh, Megan. She is also an ordained minister with the Assemblies of God. We do this full time together, um, and it's pretty incredible. So my wife, Megan, give her just one clap. One, two, three. That was pretty good. Uh, you only get one clap. All right. Um, <laughs> The top left, we have our daughters, Reagan, who is seven, and Layton, who is six. Layton is right here. She loves to sit with mom in services, and Reagan loves to go and be a part of kids' services. Uh, in fact, we've been to churches sometimes on Wednesday nights where they don't have a kids' service, but they've had Royal Rangers. And yes, my daughter has jumped into multiple Royal Rangers uh, services. If you don't know what that is, it's all boys, just burping and farting and being boys. Uh, but my, my daughter just loves being a part of whatever the kids' ministries are doing at churches that we get to go to. Um, and then I'll get to my son here in a minute. Um, what we get to do as Next Gen Directors is we get to travel across the state, and we are resources to youth and kids pastors all across the state. Uh, we, we put on camps. We put on youth convention. I actually saw a little girl right over here that had a camp T-shirt on from Kids Camp. Um, so all of that kind of stuff comes out of our office. If you've ever heard of Speed the Light or BGMC, that also comes out of our office um, we, uh, we, we get to lead initiatives like that all across the state and raise money for missionaries. If you don't know what that is, please come and find me afterwards. I'd love to talk with you about that, but I'm, I'm sure you do. And then lastly, as we get ready to jump into the word, this is my first message, uh, my first time preaching um, since our baby boy, Asher, has gone to be with Jesus. Woo! <laughs> Sorry, give me a second. Um, Asher was born in, on January of this year. I was good. <laughs> he was born in January, and he passed away on July 5th. Um, it didn't hit this hard during, the, during his funeral service. Um, but anyway, what we got to see through Asher's um, sickness and, and just everything that took place throughout the last three months of his life uh, was an incredible move of God and a journey that God took us on that I get to share with you this morning. And I'm so humbled that Pastor Todd asked me to come and preach this morning, um, to come and be here and, and spend time with you guys and that you guys get to hear what God is doing, um, not just across the state, but what God is doing in our hearts and in our lives. And, uh, and I believe truly, uh, as you see on my shirt, it says, Asher's story, God's glory, um, that God has kind of given us this task uh, to carry this baton. We, we get to carry this baton uh, of sharing Asher's story and how God's glory has been revealed in and through it and beyond uh, anything that we can really comprehend. Um, and even though it's hard, even though there's the struggle of everything that we go through, uh, God is still good. Amen? There's even peace in saying that, that God is still good. And um, my goal for today, for, for this message, uh, my goal, what I believe God has laid on my heart, is to shift each of our perspective whenever it comes to prayer and praise. This message was actually birthed out of uh, Asher's story. Um, it, the title of my message actually comes from a, a post that my wife posted in June of this year while we were in uh, the PICU of um, Iowa City, or, yeah, in Iowa City at Iowa University. Um, and I'm actually going to read it really quick because the, the title of this and this whole message, really, it's a picture of the journey that God has brought us on that we're still on and that we're still walking daily, hourly, even minute by minute. Um, even my daughter, who is back in kids' church, was having uh, just a moment during, during that prayer time. And so um, the title of my message, like I said, it comes from a, a social media post that my wife posted on June 23rd. Uh, and she said this. She said, will you join me in a day of praise? This was June 23rd, 2024. As I was awoken to prayer from 3 to 5.30 a.m., the Lord took me on a journey to shift my focus from praying for Asher's miracle to praising God for the miracle. 
What better faith do we have to praise the one who is worthy, even if our eyes don't see the promise to fruition yet? So out of that, the title, From Prayer to Praise. Can you say that with me this morning? Can you say From Prayer to Praise? One, two, three. Okay. Front row, you got it right here. But everyone else, we, we got we to step up a little bit. Say, from prayer to praise. From prayer to praise. All right, that was a little better. We're going to say it a few times as, as we go through this. But uh, my goal, my prayer, is that we shift our perspective of everyday life. Uh, and, and even the words prayer and even the word praise, that, that as, we, as we hear it, as we use prayer, as we, as we uh, it, whether it's in our de- intimate devotion with the Lord or it's just in our uh, cry of prayer throughout the day or cry of praise throughout the day, I really hope and pray that our, that our perspective is shifted in such a way that we walk out of this place changed that we walk out of this place drawing closer to God in every situation and everything that we do, that we walk out of this room truly understanding what it means to go from prayer to praise. Say from prayer to praise. Let me set this up a little bit for you this morning before we pray and get into the, get into the text. Uh, see, because the truth is we pray all the time, right? Like how many of you pray, wives, whenever your husband is driving? Students in the room, how many of you pray right before you get ready to take a test or a quiz as you're getting back to school, right? How many of you, how many of us pray that, uh, that we are able to make rent next month? How many of us, right? How many of us pray that our uh, Kansas City Chiefs are going to win the Super Bowl for a three-peat, right? How many, we pray all the time. Anybody? I got a lot of head no's, uh, heads shaking no on the Chiefs. What, what's your team then? I'm sorry, either way, no matter what. Um. (laughs) But we pray all the time. We pray, especially if we're we're devout followers of Christ, we may have our our prayer time in the morning or prayer time in the evening or or throughout the day. We, 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 We pray all the time. But how often do we praise outside of the walls of the church? Truthfully. How often can you look back on your life, maybe just this past week, and and how often did you truly praise the Lord outside of being in the walls of the church? Better yet, I'll go one step further. How often do we praise the Lord even when the prayers aren't answered like we want them to be answered? How often do we praise even whenever life isn't looking like what we want it to look like? Can I tell you if, if you, if you read through the Bible, you actually see praise used more times whenever things aren't looking good than you do whenever they are looking good, right? That's why my goal is that our, our, our perspective is shifted this morning. See, the, the truth is it is freeing to truly recognize and understand that while we have faith, hope, and trust in the Lord, it is not up to us. Nothing really is up to us. Life in and of itself is up to God. We live by his will, according to his will, and for his will. Amen? We praise him because of who he is, not just because of what he has done. We praise him because he is good. We praise him because he is love. We praise because of who God is, not what he has done. Say from prayer to praise. We're going to take a few minutes this morning, and we're going to actually look at King Jehoshaphat. Uh, if you don't know how to say his name, just say Yo Yosophat. Uh, jo- no, I just made that up. I don't know where that came from. That was not in the text. But uh, but um, we are going to say his name quite often in the in the text this morning. So instead of King, instead of saying King Jehoshaphat, we're going to say King Joe. All right? Can we can we just agree to that? All right. That way you're not thinking someone's fat every time we say his name. Um, but I'm sorry, Pastor Todd. I'm I'm unfiltered this morning. But uh, we're going to look at King Joe, and we're going to take a journey on what I believe will truly shift our perspective and our response. Say response in our response of prayer and praise. We're gonna look at 2 Chronicles 
chapter 20. Now, I know uh, that this might seem weird, it might seem different, and I actually really hope that what I'm getting ready to do takes on, and you guys do it from here on out. And Pastor Todd and I didn't talk about this beforehand, so if he wants to do it next week, that's totally up to him. But uh, a friend of mine, good friend of mine, he started doing this at his church, and I'm like, man, I love that. And every time he says the first biblical reference of the message, so for instance, today we're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, all right? So at that moment, whenever I give the first biblical reference of the message, your job is to cheer for the word, because we get excited about God's word, amen? Amen? All right, so we're going we're gonna to start that over, we're going to practice that. You guys ready? So we're going to take a few minutes this morning, and we're going to look at the story of King Joe. You're like, wait, he started way over. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to look at the story of King Joe, and we're going to take a journey that I believe will shift our perspective and our response. Say response. From prayer to praise. We're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. That was pretty good, that was pretty good, but we gotta do just a little better because I gotta know that you're gonna do this next week. All right, we're gonna be in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. There we go, there we go. All right, we're gonna pray before we read and then we're gonna get through the word this morning. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that we can stand on your promises, that we can stand on your faithfulness, stand on your goodness. Lord, we ask right now in this moment that these are not my words, but they are your words spoken to your people. Holy Spirit, would you have each of us have, uh, give us ears that are open and ready to hear, hearts that are ready to receive exactly what you would have for us this morning. And we thank and we praise you for that. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Second Chronicles chapter 20, King Joe, he was a great king of Judah. He did some really good things and he did some not so good things, but today we're actually gonna focus on some of the good things that King Joe did and, and focus on some principles really uh, that, he, that we can find in the story in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. We're gonna look through verses one through 23. Verse one, here we go, we're gonna jump in. Verse one, after this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Munites came to wage war against Joe. Some people came and told, by the way, I just noticed this has nothing to do political with anything political in the world today, okay? So if I say Joe and you think of, of President Biden, I'm sorry, we're looking at Jehoshaphat right now, okay? Came to wage war against Joe. Some people came and told Joe that a vast army was coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazazan Tamar. Alarmed, Joe resolved to inquire of the Lord. He started praying. He proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. Verse four, the people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. We're gonna look through three points today that we find in this passage, and our first point is that prayer is our first response. Say prayer. Prayer is our first response. I'm not saying that praise always has to be our last response, but I'm saying that prayer should be our first response, no matter what. Prayer should be our first response in everything that we do. Not only should prayer be our first response, but prayer should also be our pre-response. Prayer should be our preparation so that we don't have to respond or react, but so that we can be prepared. What am I talking about? Well, uh, in school, uh, growing up, how many of you remember what the drill was for in case you caught on fire? Good job, come on, stop, drop, and roll. Well, I was, uh, I was a, uh, not quite a homeschooled kid, but almost a homeschooled kid because I went to a, a private school that my mom was also the principal at, and uh, <laughs> seriously, and she did something, this was a Christian school, so she did something that instead of stop, drop, and roll, which we, we practiced that for fire safety, but we did something for spiritual safety, and it was called stop, drop, and pray. Stop, drop, and pray. And I'm gonna take that one step further, something that I've just kind of taken on as an adult, and that is stop, pray, and fast. Stop, pray, and fast. And this is, this is not so much as a response as it is to prepare. And actually, if you look and you read in Mark chapter nine, you actually see a, a perfect example of why fasting and praying is needed 
not just for responding, but for preparation. You see in, in Mark chapter nine, the disciples were trying to cast out a demon from a young boy and they were unable to do so. So Jesus came in and what did Jesus do? He drove out the demon and then the disciples did what? Do you guys, do you guys know this story? The disciples looked at Jesus and they said, why couldn't we do it? Why couldn't, we, why couldn't we drive out the demon? Why couldn't we cast out the demon? And Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, this kind, say this kind. This kind can only be driven out through what? Prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. Prayer should not only be our response in times of trouble or in times of just when life is, is being life, but it is also our preparation to do what God has called us to do. It is also so that we can prepare to do what God has called us to do. Say, what has God called me to do? Well, you can look in Matthew 28 and you can see exactly what God has called you to do. Therefore, go and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are called to take the gospel to the furthest corners of the world, whether that is the corners of your world that you live in right here in Granger or the furthest corners of the world across seas. We are called to carry the gospel. And in a lot of cases, I'm gonna say every case, it is impossible to carry the gospel as we should without praying and fasting. Amen? It's not only a response, but it's a preparation for what God has called us to do. Praying and fasting is our first line of defense, but it's not our only line of defense. Say from prayer to praise. Okay, we're getting a little quieter every time now. Here we go. We're going to keep going. Verse 5. Then Joe stood up in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard. And you can read through verses 6 through 12. It literally is King Joe's public prayer and pleading with God to move on their behalf. We're going to pick up in verse 13. It says, All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood before the Lord. Then the spirit of the Lord came on Jahaziel. Now, uh, we're going we're gonna to kind of pause here for just a second because I want you to understand something. It matters who you're standing with. It matters who you're standing with in life. Yes, we are called to be the light of the world. We're called to share the light of the world and the darkness of the world. Students, as you head into school this year, you are called to be the light within your school and to carry the light within your school and to your school. But it also matters who you're doing it with. You look around this room right here. I can tell you these are people that you want to do life with. These are people that you wanna link arms with. There was a group of what, 15 of us, maybe more this morning in pre-service prayer. Guys, that's not very common. Like the worship team might gather backstage to pray at some churches, or the pastor of course is always praying, but uh, hopefully at least. Uh, <laughs> but but it's, it's not always common for an entire volunteer staff to gather and pray over what God is doing. Guys, it matters who you are standing with. King Joe, in this moment, as, as he stood up and, and first he called for a prayer and fast across the entire land of Judah, and then as he stood before everyone, <coughs> excuse me, there was a man that stood up. Why? Because he was standing with King Joe in that moment, and he was hearing from God just as King Joe was praying. Right? As we skip through his lineage, it says, as he stood in the assembly, in this moment, Jahaziel was obedient to the Lord. In this moment, he stood up and delivered the word that God gave him. Judah literally fought this battle together. It wasn't just King Joe giving direction, although his response of prayer and his response in that moment impacted his people, but, but it matters who he was fighting with. I wanna encourage you this morning, if you don't have people in your life, if you're not linking arms with people who are standing with you in times of battle, who are standing with you in times of struggle, who are, who are standing with you in the good times and the bad times, if you're not linking arms with people who are pointing you to Christ in each of those situations, then you need to find some new people to link arms with. And then have those people help you pull the other people out of whatever thing they're stuck in. Amen? You with me this morning? 
Get people in your life who won't join in in the or who, who will who won't join in on the pity parties, but will be a voice of encouragement, a voice of wisdom, a voice of reason. Someone who will speak truth and life in every situation, not death and defeat. See, because if you, if you look at it, you actually see that the first people, their response was that this army is getting close, right? This ar- the, it, it might already be too late. This army is coming in, King Joe. They're, they're already crossing the river. They're already right here at our borders. They're, they're already here. What are we gonna do? But the second group of people or, or the second person that you hear, he gives this. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but it is God's. That's a pretty stark difference to the first people that we heard about in this, right? Because the first people were like, hey, king, this army is coming, they're crossing the river, they're here. Whereas Jahazil is like, this isn't our battle, guys. Listen to the word of the Lord. This isn't our battle. My biggest point out of that is that King Jehoshaphat's response, it impacted his people's perspective. It impacted his people's perspective perspective. Church, your response as the body of Christ in just about everything in life will impact the world's perspective. I'll give you a great illustration of this. This is bonus content. Uh, a few years ago, I was, we were actually living in Florida. Um, I, I had Reagan and Layton. Layton was just a few months old. She was probably maybe just under a year old. And my, my older daughter, Reagan, was uh, almost three and for some reason, my wife was out of town. I don't know why she left me with the girls, but whatever. Um, but anyway, at that time, we were still uh, eating McDonald's, and we don't do that anymore, and you're going to know why here in just a second. Um, but uh, I, I remember we went through the drive-thru, and, uh, and I ordered my quarter pounder with cheese, ordered Reagan some nuggets, and, uh, and our house was just a few blocks away from McDonald's. So I went home, uh, got Reagan set up with her chicken nuggets. I can't remember what I fed, Leighton, some sort of yogurt or something, I'm sure. And then, uh, and then I got my quarter pounder with cheese. And now just have my back on this, even if you don't. Um, quarter, a good quarter pounder with cheese with ketchup only is just good. It's okay, that was a very reluctant laugh. Um, like a good quarter pounder with cheese can be heavenly whenever you didn't have to cook it, you didn't have to, you didn't have to prepare it, it's like just good. And, uh, and I remember I got Reagan set, Leighton set, they're all happy, and I grab my quarter pounder and I take a big old bite out of it, and I'm pretty sure I heard the cow still mooing as I took the bite out of it. I didn't even know McDonald's sold uncooked food. I thought they just heated it up in the microwave, but apparently this beef was not cooked in any way, shape, or form. And, uh, and as I bit into it um, and tried not to throw up in front of my daughters, uh, I had a decision that I quickly had to make. What is my response going to be in this moment, right? Because all the people in the room, you know, whenever you're dealing with two kids, three and under, and you've got your lunch and you're happy to eat it, it's a big deal when you all of a sudden can't eat that lunch, right? Especially when they're content. So what did I do? Well, I packed the girls up after Reagan finished her nuggets. I put them back in the car. I drove back to McDonald's. I went inside holding the pumpkin seat in one arm and having my other daughter uh, in my other arm holding the quarter pounder with cheese. And I walked up to the counter and I just said, "Um, excuse me, is there any way that I could swap this out for something that isn't still breathing? the lady behind the counter smiled and laughed and she said, absolutely, made me a new one, it was all good. Why do I tell you that story? Well, because whenever I walked in and I put that at the counter, there was another individual. I have never met this person in my life, but they watched the whole thing. They listened to the whole thing. And I will never forget that person, whenever, whenever I stepped back and they were cooking my quarter pounder finally, that lady said, I am so surprised by how you responded. I am so surprised by how you responded. She's like, I would have flipped out. I'm like, well, thank you. <laughs> but walking away, I, said, I thought, man, the world is always watching. 
the world is always watching us as the body of Christ. You may not think that that's fair. There's a lot of things that aren't fair. But that's why Jesus says to take up your cross and follow me, right? That's, <laughs> that may seem like a simple, silly illustration, but I'm telling you guys, the world is watching how you respond. And as a part of the body of Christ, students, the world is watching how you respond. When that teacher who you think is being disrespectful to you, the world is watching how you respond. Men and women in this room in the workplace, your coworkers are watching how you respond. The people who you stand with matter. Through the leadership of King Joe, jumping back into it, Judah and Jerusalem, they stopped, they prayed, and they fasted, and all of a sudden, people are talking about God's power. People are talking about God's ability to protect them. Then Jahasil gives a plan for battle. Verse six, he says, tomorrow we will march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz and you will, and you will find them at the edge of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. Verse 17, you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. Prayer is our first response, but obedience is our second response. Obedience is our second response. See, Jahaziel, he gave the word of the Lord that the Lord will fight their battles with them or that the Lord will fight their battles for them. But then he goes on to say, but we need to go and get on the front line of battle. How many of you are a little intrigued by that, right? Like, wait, why do we have to go and get on the front line of battle if God is gonna fight this battle for us? Well, we still have to be obedient to what he is asking us to do and what he is asking us to walk through and everything that he lays on your heart. We have to be obedient in those moments and that, it, it is in that obedience that we can see God move. You hear me? He's already given us the word of the Lord if you wanna look at it in a different way. He's already given us the word of the Lord. He doesn't have to give you a dropping in your spirit. He doesn't have to, he doesn't have to uh, impress something within you to, for you to be obedient to. We can already be obedient to his word. You understand, you tracking with me? Obedience is our response, our second response. As a parent, obedience is key to my kids survival, right? Right? Your kids being obedient to you. I'm, are you guys still with me this morning? Your kids being obedient to you is vital to your kids' survival. You with me? I'll give you another illustration because I like illustrations, but <clears throat> my daughter, if we're playing out in the front yard, uh, this would totally not be Reagan because she is a rule follower. She, she goes by everything that we say. If, if, I give her something as a rule, uh, she will follow it, and if she is on the verge of not following it, all it takes is me looking at her and she understands. Any firstborns out there that totally get what I'm talking about, right? But then there's my secondborn, who I'm pretty sure uh, might stab me one day. Um, I'm just kidding, that's, that's really morbid, we won't go there. But, but she likes to just break rules just to see what happens. Um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty fun as a parent. But for my daughters, uh, I give them the rule to not run out in the streets. Is that rule there just to make sure that they don't have fun or is that rule there to protect them? To protect them, right? The Lord has given us guidelines. The Lord has given us instruction. The Lord has given us things not to keep us from having fun, but to keep us protected, to keep us on track, to keep us within his plan and within his will. Obedience, church, is our key to survival within this world. Amen? You with me this morning? See, God is a good father. <clears throat> he is a good protector. It is foolishness to be disobedient when all he wants to do is to keep us from running in the street. Come on. We must be obedient. I'm gonna give you some examples. We must be obedient to the word of God. We must be obedient to the holiness that he calls us to. We must be obedient to his call for repentance. 
We must be obedient to his commands. We must be obedient. And when you fast and pray, be obedient to the word that God gives you. Be obedient to his battle plan. Be obedient to his de desire to draw near to you. Be obedient to the stirring of the Holy Spirit. Be obedient to the great commission and be obedient and get in position as he leads you and guides you. Amen? Verse 18, continuing on. King Job bowed down with his face to the ground and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshiped before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and the Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Early in the morning, they left the desert of Tekoa. As they sat out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah, and the people of Jerusalem. Have faith in, your, in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in, the, in his prophets, and you will be successful. Verse 21, after consulting the people, Joe appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Prayer is our first response. Obedience is our second response. But church, praise is our best response. Praise is the best thing we have to offer. Praise is our best response. I love how my daughter puts it. She actually uh, said this in Asher's celebration service. She said, praise. It'll get you out of prison. <laughs> and she was actually giving reference to Acts chapter 16, where Paul and Silas are in, in prison. And um, if, I mean, I know Pastor Todd was there at the service. If you haven't had the chance to, to go and watch the service, you're getting the majority of the message right here, other than the best part, which was when my daughter stepped up on stage. And without me prompting her in any way, Actually, I was trying to get her to go a different direction. She said, Dad, can I just do what I think God is telling me to do? Can I just do, can I just read the story that I think I'm supposed to read? And I said, absolutely. And she goes, I want to read Acts chapter 16, where Paul and Silas praised and got out of prison. And as she stood on stage and she, and she read Acts chapter 16 and then she told the entire uh, church that was gathered there, the entire body of Christ that was gathered there, she said, praise It'll get you out of prison. And I thought, man, oh man, if we could only have the perspective of an eight-year-old girl that trusts the Lord with all of her heart. In fact, I've actually got a video that I'm gonna show you here in just a second. This video, uh, again, nobody prompted her to this. Nobody asked her to go and do this. Uh, but Asher passed away on a Friday, right? Thursday, Friday, July 5th, whatever day that was. We went to church the following Sunday morning, and as soon as worship started, this is what my daughter did. Not even 72 hours after her baby brother went to be with Jesus, her only response was praise. Her only response was praise. Worship team, you can go ahead and head on up, start playing that Nord to make this sound more spiritual. But my daughter's only response, 72 hours after her baby brother went to be with Jesus, was to praise. And not only was she praising, but she was crying out, I trust in God. I trust in God. I say, man, how is it that in times like that, that you can cry out, that you can praise, that has nothing to do with who we are as people. It has everything to do with who he is as God. Prayer is our first, obedience is our second but praise is our best response, church. We praise him not for what we want, but for, but for how good he is. We praise him for who he is. We praise him not for what he's done or will do, but we praise him for his holiness. We praise him for his greatness. We praise him uh, not because, uh, 
not because it benefits us, but because it can shift our perspective. It can, it can shift how we look at things in life. Verse 22, as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. And after they finished slaughtering the men of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. What a picture of how God goes before you and fights your battles. But it took the men and women of Jerusalem to be obedient, first to pray and fast, and then to be obedient and get on the front line. Even if, even if they trusted in God, even, even though they had the word that said that God was gonna go before them, they still went to the front lines in preparation for battle. And then whenever it came time, they praised. They praised. God went before Judah and Jerusalem and defeated the enemy. And in that moment, everything shifted from prayer to praise. Can I tell you that God has already gone before you? He has already defeated your enemy through his son, Jesus. He has already gone before you and our battle is already won. My son, his battle was won before he was even conceived, conceived in his mother's womb. You say, but how can, how can you say that? Asher's not here. I might just adopt this to say in every message that I ever preach again, because what I'm getting ready to say to me, it's what I stand on. You can't defeat someone who calls Jesus their Lord and Savior. You say, but what are you talking about? How? By all accounts of the world, Asher was defeated. You can't defeat someone who calls Jesus Savior. Say, but Pastor Ryan, I feel really defeated today. It's okay. You can't defeat someone whose ultimate goal is heaven. The enemy might make you think that life is looking really dark. And he does. He can make you think that. But he can't defeat you when your ultimate goal is heaven. I'll take that one step further. As a parent, my ultimate goal for my kids is not that they can provide for me one day, although that would be nice. <laughs> my ultimate goal for my kids is not that, not that they have a white picket fence with, and give me grandkids or give, give my wife and I grandkids one day. That's not my ultimate goal for my kids, even though that would be amazing if that happens. My ultimate goal for my kids isn't that they graduate high school and go on and graduate college and, and, and have all honors and all of that. That's not the ultimate goal for my kids, although all of that would be nice and there's nothing wrong with all of that. No, my ultimate goal for my kids is that they walk on streets of gold one day. The ultimate goal for my kids is that one day they stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. That's how praise is our best response. Because we know that here on this earth, as followers of Christ, the enemy cannot touch us. He thinks he can. He can impact the things that we see, the things that we feel, the things that we walk through, but he cannot touch your eternity as a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, I would encourage you, ask the Lord into your heart. Give your life over to him. In Romans, it says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that Jesus died and God raised him from the, from the grave, then, then you will be saved. It is that simple. It is that easy. Believe in your heart who Jesus is and what he did for you. You will be saved. And then the enemy cannot touch you. Your life might get a lot harder, 
hello, but the enemy cannot touch you. Amen? You with me? Say from prayer to praise. See, we worship or we praise not because we're necessarily looking for our circumstances to change, but rather our perspective to change. Praise might not change your circumstance, but it does change your perspective. Amen? God has gone before us, so we praise. God has given us freedom with, uh, from, the, from the sting of death, so we praise. He has blessed us with the breath of life, so we praise. He has given us the ability to be in relationship with him, so we praise. God is good, so we praise. God is love, so we praise. God is God, so we praise. We don't praise because of what he does or doesn't do. We praise, we worship, and we live in relationship with him because it is the greatest possible gift that this life has to offer on this side of heaven is to get to praise and worship our heavenly father. We don't praise because of what he does, church. We worship because he is good. If God never did anything ever again for me in my life, I would still praise him because he is still good. Amen? We're gonna close this morning by singing a song. Pastor Todd asked me if there was any song that I'd like to close with, and I gave him two options, and they chose this one, and I love this one. Uh, we're gonna sing the song, God, You're So Good. Say, so why do we sing that song? Well, it ties in the message, one, but, but two, this song was on repeat for three or four days the last three or four days of Asher's life. And as it played on repeat, we, we, we were not only playing it as, as, a, as a step of faith, but we were playing it, I was playing it because I wanted the enemy to understand that it didn't matter what he did or what he threw at us or, or what happens with Asher, that our faith is still in Jesus that our Lord is still good. We wanted, we wanted the enemy to know that God is still good. He is still on the throne. We wanted God to know that we will still choose him, that we will still praise him, that we will still serve him, that God, we still know that you are good. I wanna challenge you this morning as you stand to your feet moving forward, let praise be your response. Students, an attitude of praise will change your response, it will shape your heart, and it will increase your impact. Adults in the room, an attitude of praise will change your response, it will shape your heart, and it will increase your impact. Even when we don't feel it, we say, God, you're so good. Come on, would you just start to worship him in this moment? God, you're so good. Even in the pain and brokenness, God, you're so good. Even when things don't look the way that we want them to, God, you are so good. Even when you get let go from that job, God, you're so good. Even when your kids says that they hate you, God, you're so good. Even when your life is flipped upside down, God, you are so good. Even when the enemy has you pinned in a corner and you don't see any way out, God, you are so good. Because that is the only way out, church. Proclaiming the goodness, the faithfulness, and the glory of God over your life. Our response is praise. Our response is prayer. Our response is obedience. God, you are so good. We worship you. We thank you. And we praise you. Amen. Let's go.
cross from age to age and hour by hour the dead are raised the sinners saved the work of your power